just before we get started, I wanted to let everybody know that if you could kindly keep your telephones or audio devices on mute, that would be great. Uh, on our side, we're going to try and mute all of the participants. So um, hopefully, we'll be able to control the background noise that way. But if you could also uh, watch for any muting on your end, sometimes that helps as well. So my name is Tulika Rastogi, and I am the Policy and Research Manager at the Canadian Federation of Humane Societies, or the CFHS, Canada's Voice for Animal Welfare. And I'd like to welcome you to the first in our series, the first webinar in conjunction with the CFHS's Accessible Spay Neuter Project. Some of you may be aware of our project, and for those of you who aren't, I would invite you to please visit our website, cfhs.ca, and click on Accessible Spay Neuter, where you will find a suite of tools that help organizations and individuals across Canada to both advocate for and actually implement accessible sterilization services for companion animals. So as part of the project, we'll be hosting a number of webinars from now until the end of 2014 to highlight real-world initiatives that are increasing accessible spay-neuter in Canada. And these are examples where organizations have taken best practices about how to implement accessible programs, such as those that you uh, can see on our website, and they fit them into the particular geographic, sociocultural context of their own communities. So please check back on our website for details about the upcoming sessions. And also, I wanted to let you know that the webinars will be recorded and available on the website for you to listen to or watch at your convenience. So for today, I'm excited to introduce the presenter of our first webinar, Ms. Amy Morris. Amy Morris is the Policy and Outreach Officer for the British Columbia SPCA working on spay-neuter outreach programs and policy-based initiatives. Amy has a Master of Public Policy from Simon Fraser University, where she wrote her thesis on dog breeding regulation. Although she has been surrounded by companion animals from birth, she really got her start in helping animals by volunteering at the Montreal Puppy Mill and Hoarder Emergency Shelter. Personally, Amy has been very generous in sharing with me her wealth of knowledge on companion animal issues. So I'm thrilled that she'll be sharing her expertise with all of you today. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Amy, who will be speaking about saving lives through prevention, getting serious about cat spay neuter. Thank you, Tulika. And I'm excited to be able to share some of this knowledge across the country because I think there's a lot of things that are going on in the US that we've been working to adopt here in Canada as well. So I'll get started. Just to give you some background on the BCSPCA and the context that I operate within, uh, we have a map here showing all of our facilities across the province. And uh, those vary from animal shelters to education and adoption centers, um, satellite adoption locations, veterinary facilities, and a wildlife rehab center. Uh, we also do cruelty investigations across the province. Uh, advocate for change. Uh, we have a humane education department doing a magazine and other kids camps. And then we have a farm animal welfare program uh, where we have SPCA certified uh, animal products that uh, people can buy in the store. So we really have a wide breadth of different services we provide in relation to animals. So historically, as an organization, we started off by trying to prevent cruelty to animals, um, mostly related to working horses. And it was really an advocacy type organization. But over time, we realized that animals really weren't, companion animals really weren't getting a good deal. They were being uh, killed in mass numbers in really inhumane ways. And so actually, in a strange way, we actually started out as uh, having euthanasia clinics because we wanted animals to be killed humanely. And then started taking in animals. Our first shelter was in Vancouver. Over time, we took over kenneling contracts in order to house animals humanely and shelter them humanely. 
And then in 1976, we established the first uh, low-cost spay-neuter clinic in Canada. Uh, and then in 2005 and 2009, we started our other two spay-neuter clinics. And so what we see really is this transition from uh, reactive dealing with pet overpopulation, where we're just wanting to deal with it in a humane way, to now a preventative approach of trying to make sure we don't have to do anything uh, beyond sterilizing animals. And so we have some numbers vaguely about what euthanasia was back in 1974 in British Columbia. Um, and we see numbers as high as 70,000 animals, um, which seems impossible. It seems like a number that you couldn't imagine touching that many animals in a year uh, as an organization um, that we're now down to a, a very, very m much lower number. Um, and we're also seeing that our numbers are significantly lower than the national numbers for euthanasia. And so something with those spay neuter clinics has really made a huge uh, difference in British Columbia. We did a uh, Strategic, our new strategic plan uh, survey for the public in 2013. And the second ranking thing was reducing pet overpopulation, including spay and neuter programs. So we recognize the need to really, the, the public is recognizing that need to really be preventative rather than reactive. And so I'm, I'm going to make two assumptions today. One is that spaying and neutering prevents the birth of outdoor living kittens who end up homeless or dead. So this is really, we know this is effective. And then when we have a, an effective spay-neuter program, they do this for the long term. So we know that it's not just a short-term solution, but we're exponentially de decreasing the suffering. So we want to be effective. We don't want to just help the animal that we see in front of us. We want to help animals over time. And I'm just going to pause for one second because that just auto-advanced my slide. OK. Sorry about that. And so just an outline for what we'll be covering today is how partnership is effective in reaching spay and neuter goals, how to use technology and data to be successful in your spay and neuter program, and also how to craft effective messaging to educate and create long-term change, because we know that we really want that long-term versus short-term animal in our hand, or that we can just spay and neuter one. And so I'll just go through a couple different models of collaboration that we use across the province. One is uh, Prince George, where we have our uh, spay-neuter clinic. Historically, we had small investments into spay-neuter in this community that were spread out. So we didn't have a spay or neuter program. It was something where um, animals that came and needed help were helped. But we didn't necessarily have enough funding in, in the community. It's a kind of impoverished community to actually address the issues. And that's where we applied for Pet Smart Charities of Canada funding, which we're very thankful to receive. But we knew that we couldn't just, um, just apply the funding. We needed some kind of partnership in place. And so we actually approached four different veterinarians in the area to ask them to match the pricing that we were able to offer through our spay and neuter clinic for this program. And they were all quite eager to participate. They recognized that um, they could actually get clients out of this because they then had people's addresses. They could send them reminders that they did get vaccines. Um, and so they were willing to participate. Then we had the shelter, the municipality, media, volunteers to do door knocking, put up posters and the cat caregivers who were actually doing some of the trapping. Um, and I guess that's my only slide on that one. So um, really, 
what ended up happening in this community is we did in one year 800 surgeries um, specifically geared at one neighborhood and we've seen a drastic impact on the number of cats coming into the shelter. Um, it's over time gone down about 50% because of our spay neuter clinic and it looks like in one year it went down approximately 30% more um, to see just such a concentrated impact and having everyone work together. We also have a program uh, in Maple Ridge which we approached the district who we have a good relationship with uh, for some spay and neuter funding. We have um, cat overpopulation there is not severe but it, there is a bylaw in place in regards to cat care and in requiring that cats be spayed and neutered and we thought that in order to make that accessible we needed to make sure that low-income people had an option available. And so the municipality approved the funding but requested that it be distributed with the cat rescue that we're located um, next door to. So historically we had some disagreements around uh, euthanasia and um, generally on, on some standards for cat care with this organization even though their facility is right next to us. And so we decided to do a dialogue so that we could um, really get into some of the, the details of where we need to go and how we can collaborate. So this is the poster um, that came out of the dialogue and you can see that it's, it's kind of elaborate but we, we came across many different ideas of what needs to be done and we work together on uh, how we should use that funding. And so this is up in the room that we use to meet and um, we kind of have it as a reminder that we don't need to focus on where we disagree but if we focus on where we agree we can make a bigger impact. And so now um, this is a smaller program, it's a smaller community. We've done 170 surgeries through the program um, but it's really, we play on each other's strengths. So in their case, they do much of the trapping and working with cat caregivers. And in our case, we work with the, we have that public face and the lobby. So we work with uh, low income uh, people using the program. And so the benefit of this is that each agency is doing the work that they're the best at. We have more volunteers between us and we have less chance of one organization burning out. A few other programs, um, one is what we're doing is funding trap neuter return across the province. We recognize that we can't do it ourselves all the time and that there are people out there who are already trapping but they may be burnt out, they may not have funding available and so through legacies that were dedicated to cat spay and neuter, um, donated by, by different uh, amazing people who, who really cared about cats we're able to distribute that money in small increments to target unique colonies and as well as First Nations reserves. Um, and so the impact of that is we're reaching out to places where we see the most overpopulation and the people who are most passionate about ending it. And so we have a lot of success uh, with that program. Last year we sterilized about 800 cats through it and we're looking to be um, to do a lot more in this year and next year. So we're helping those cats that are most at risk of suffering, the ones that are never touching the shelter because they're just living this wildlife, they're, they're predating on animals, they're dying outdoors um, and we also have that um, capacity to share with others. We actually are doing more as an organization and we're decreasing shelter intake and so really it's, it's a win-win situation um, that forming these partnerships has made a huge impact on, on our reach across the province. Finally, we use our clinics to provide support for trap neuter return. And so uh, we have three clinics that do low-cost band neuter surgeries across the province. Um, but if caregivers are able to trap, we will sterilize feral and free roaming cats for free at those facilities. And then once per year we use them as media events. So we, um, we get volunteers, lots of veterinarian volunteers as well as um, vet technicians, vet assistants, and we will have through our clinic in Vancouver 125 um, cats come through in one day. And um, this really, we get the media in and we bring attention to the issue 
of uh, free roaming cats and, and their poor welfare. So this also um, allows the main thing is allows trappers to focus on their work rather than having to fundraise. They, they don't have to worry about cost. And so some question, we won't have time necessarily for the questions today, but something to write down to think about um, is how can you overcome barriers to collaboration in your community? Um, so how can you make that uh, next step for dialogue or to work with a vet clinic to, to make the kind of change that you need to see in your community. We'll move on to the next section. Uh, this is using technology to achieve success, data collection and mapping. And um, data collection is really important for granting agencies. It's important um, for yourself so you know if you have been effective. And so what is success? How do you know you've had a successful program? Um, there's no perfect method to figure it out. Um, the live release rate will be going up in the community, assuming you're doing enough surgeries. And intake and euthanasia should decrease. Uh, adoptions should remain the same. So you shouldn't be decreasing the amount of adoptions you're doing. But um, you should be really seeing uh, that impact where cats are no longer having negative outcomes. Um, when it comes to colonies, you may not see that as much, but you can actually see a colony decline. And so we want to track that. We need accurate data, and uh, we need to be able to target communities so we see that effective decline. The information that I, I think is really helpful to track is the source of the intake, so where it's coming from, the address, uh, what is the outcome, of each animal, uh, and then what is the number of spay and neuter surgeries that you're doing, as well as the addresses of where those surgeries are coming from. And I'll explain why um, in a bit. I'll show you a map where you can see that data. So this is a, a volunteer of ours developed a website for us uh, called catmapper.ca. And it, um, but it, it does what any GIS tool uses. It, it maps different addresses. And this allows us to do targeting uh, for flyers, for example. And it's really important, what we found, is to have accurately recorded addresses. Because many of our addresses were finding, like, cat in trunk of car um, next to trailer park. And you're going, OK, well, that's not going to load into a GIS tool. The person who wrote it down knows exactly where it is. But it doesn't help um, us data nerds. So making sure your shelter staff know how to document addresses is crucial. And so this is a, a, an image taken from CatMapper. And um, what you can see is the blue is our intake in 2013 um, in Prince George. And then the green is the span neuter surgeries that were conducted in 2013. And so I actually have the ability to zoom in and see what neighborhoods we have a lot of intake coming from. And then if there's no spay and neuter surgeries being done in that neighborhood, I'll send a message to our, our team there and say, oh, you, you should probably get some volunteers together and flyer that neighborhood because we're not seeing people come in. Uh, and that has a huge impact on what our intake numbers actually look like. And um, you can also input local knowledge of colonies on a map. So start tracking out where you think your colonies are. Uh, and that can help with getting funding for grants. So uh, we've used that in the past when we're trying to access funding so that the organization that's giving the granting actually sees how the population looks in that area. You can also start to mark the spayed and neutered cats against those that are still need to be done to, to track your success. Uh, so this is an example of Burns Lake. This is a community where we do TNR. And you can see um, where there's concentrations of cats in this whole area. So um, you can really see where things need to be targeted. So what I, I think you can kind of take some time to think about and write down is where is your data collection at? Can you easily pull a report of where cats are coming from? And can you actually have a volunteer put that on a map? Uh, and so it, it doesn't have to be a web map. I personally think that web maps can be very useful because you can 
keep adding to them, and you can move them, and you can share them and take screenshots. But it can be a physical map on the wall as well. And in, in some of our communities, that's really the only thing that makes sense to them because they, they don't want to fuss with technology. And um, so in one community, we actually have talked about them putting it on a map, taking a picture of it, and then I have a local volunteer who I know can use the site, and they can actually upload that data. So I'll go on to the next section, um, and, and really this section is about how to make all of this effective. We can do the work, we can take action uh, and continue to just spay and neuter and spay and neuter and spay and neuter, but we'll all have the same job in 50 years if we just kind of don't target, if we just take in whatever animal comes our way and we don't change our messaging. And this is something that I've been focusing more and more on, is how we can actually create cultural, societal change that makes what we're doing now worthwhile, that actually makes an impact so that someday we'll be needing to do some kind of different work than spaying and neutering. And so a couple different messages around that. Uh, one is using different mediums for the same message. So one thing that people say is people need to hear something seven times before it sinks in. And so we might use um, all different mediums and continually with our same message of, um, in this case, one, one cat can have an inordinate amount of kittens in the end. Um, and this posted really well on our social media. It actually had 915 shares, which is pretty high. Um, we've seen higher in some memes, but for uh, a message that we want to change culture to get out that much is, is big for us. And so if it's compelling enough, if it's entertaining enough, or if it has enough of a bite, it will get shared and sponsored. You can reach beyond the people that you're normally reaching. So the people that have heard the message lots, are bored of it, um, they, they've done the right thing, so it just stops at them because they say, well, I'm doing the right thing. Uh, I don't need this message. So then we also use the same kind of messaging um, in terms of doing it for traditional media. So newspapers, uh, TV, radio, and then getting creative with ad space. So something I've considered in Prince George is that they have this huge country fair and they send out a little pamphlet to everyone in the whole community. So everyone in Prince, every, all 78,000 residents get this pamphlet. So that's the perfect place to get your message in, in a place where you have a, a program uh, running because you can really say, okay, I want everyone, I want to blanket this with, blanket the community with our message. Uh, bus stops are also effective. And so you're reaching a general audience, but it can be targeted. Uh, for example, if it's we have a Country Life in BC newspaper that we use because we're reaching rural people. So if we're going to develop a rural message, we'll use that kind of um, tool versus maybe a more urban message with bus stops. And another example is uh, our Bark Magazine uh, and generally our youth education. So we know that youth don't have their minds set in stone yet. We have some kind of influence over their future behaviors, and that's something that the BCSPCA has focused on for many, many, many years, and I think that's why we are where we are today. Um, and so we have curriculum materials that teachers can use to incorporate into any classroom setting, um, and right now we're working on a pet overpopulation curriculum unit. And then we also have uh, presenters going and doing school presentations. We have the Bark Magazine that gets sent to every school uh, in British Columbia, as well as libraries across British Columbia. And many people also um, subscribe to it. I believe it also goes to veterinarians. And then we also do birthday parties. So we make it fun. We bring people into our shelters to, to understand what the mission is. and. Um, and really, that's one kid who's passionate reaching out to all of their friends. And then all of their friends might think it's cool to do that birthday, birthday party. So it's positive peer change that we see through that program. Uh, and 
another thing that we found is a different message for the same outcome. So um, I have a number of videos here. I don't know um, if they'll actually work if I click on them. So um, we'll try one, and then I'll let one of the organizers um, let me know if you can hear uh, the sound from it. You may not, but um, I, I can try to hold the, the microphone up to the volume. And I can at least show you this one's uh, our PSA. I don't know. I'm really worried about her. She's been staying out late. Sometimes doesn't come home in the morning. I think she might come home pregnant one day. You think it might be time to get her spayed? Hmm? I'm a proud Canadian, just like you. And in my family and my community, animals are important. We know that unwanted litters suffer. We do our part by spaying and neutering our cats and dogs before they are six months old. Do your part. Spay and neuter now. So that is um, the PSA that we put together last year to try to reach out to the kind of rural male population. Um, and, and I know that that's not everyone we need to reach. We need to reach um, people who are going to think it's a cute, you know, like people who love cat memes generally. Um, we need to reach people who are speaking different languages than us. Uh, and so I've got a number of links here that you can visit after the webinar and see how each of those messages really makes uh, a different impact than, um, than what you might traditionally think, uh, like a scare tactic, or um, maybe the celebrity might make the big impact. And so thinking about your audience uh, is crucial. And as we're developing more and more campaigns, um, right now we've kind of targeted three different audiences that we know we need to reach. And one is people who are feeding one cat outdoors but don't think that there's a whole neighborhood of them. Uh, another is, is people, who, um, people who have kind of uh, we call them the mushy middle, the people who aren't really eager to spay and neuter. They don't know that their cat's likely going to get pregnant in the first kind of year of its life. And then the last is really the rural farm mentality that, okay, that, that cat's just going to get eaten by a coyote, so we'll just get another cat or that we need it to reproduce. And we realize that those three different groups are three very different mental states. And so one message isn't going to help all of them. And we're looking at, right now, developing messaging for each one of those core groups. And that's where we're seeing the most cat overpopulation in our province uh, is through those. Uh, so just as we've done all these different programs, for example, our TNR programs and funding those across the province, we're recognizing what what is being TNR. In some cases, it's not just a, a colony at a house, it might be an entire neighborhood of people all feeding outdoor cats that are reproducing and none of them talk. They're very isolated, they all have their long driveways, and um, but they're all starting to call this one organization in the area. And that organization is going out to each of the houses and trapping, sterilizing, and returning that cat. The person cares about the cat. and. Um, but we want to get some more messaging so that people start to maybe consider that them feeding that cat could be um, part what's leading to this massive colony that they don't even realize exists yet. So solving those problems starts with identifying them and then figuring out who the audience is and then starting to target kind of marketing and messaging to them. Another thing that I think is really crucial is customer service. Um, your approach to how you treat people makes a huge impact on the success of a program. Uh, every surrender that comes into your shelter or free or low-cost spay and neuter recipient should be treated with respect. Um, they should not be 
told that they're dumping an animal, they should not have language that makes them feel bad about what they're doing because what they're doing they know is actually the best thing and they're reaching out. They're the ones that we're actually seeing. Um, so we, act, we need those people to be our advocates in the community. They are the window to everyone else who's not taking that action. But they, they have the opportunity to say, I had this fantastic experience at the shelter. Uh, you, you should go too. You'll have that good experience as well. And so that is, to me, one opportunity that person has to understand and internalize our message. And it's that one opportunity they, we have to share with them so that they share with others, which is more impactful than any advertisement, than any um, PSA could ever be. And, and the other thing um, is considering using targeting rather than income measures to have a successful program. So for example, in Prince George, anyone in what we call the bowl could access the program. So we navigated to a very specific geographic neighborhood and then we let everyone in that neighborhood use that program. So that's really going back to using your data effectively because you can r tell where the animals are coming from. It doesn't matter if their owner has a million dollars because they, that, or their, the person feeding them has a million dollars because they're still entering your shelter. And so targeting the neighborhood of where the cats are coming in from is really what's going to impact the kind of euthanasia rates at a shelter. Um, and also, it does tend to reflect what's going on in the community. And this, to me, is some of the most crucial um, change is happens through our staff. It happens through our volunteers. And it happens through how we message out into the community. Um, we, can, we can do the first two things. We can have the programs. We can use the data. But if we're not positive and if we're not trying to make that cultural change, uh, we, won't, we won't see it happen. And so this is um, really the point for questions. But I do want to give a, a little bit of advice, which is um, try to keep your focus try to not just get overwhelmed by the burden, but recognize that you can make an impact if you think through um, every step of the process, whether it's even the veterinary interaction at the very beginning, uh, when you can start to talk to veterinarians in a positive way from the perspective of re really them telling you what they want and you figuring out how you can do what you want within what they want. Um, and so using techniques to get everyone on board with your mission. The other thing I recommend is doing hands-on work outside of your own organization. Um, so I volunteer for Canadian Animal Assistance Team. Um, and this was a, a, I was holding these kittens while their mom was having her flank spay. Um, and this, Really, I, I do a lot of nerdy data work. I do a lot of grant administration. But it's important for me to actually participate and go out into the community. And I'm constantly traveling to see what these colonies look like, to interact with the people so that I can think more thoroughly about what the strategy is that will make success in the province. Um, and, and don't get burnt out by spay and neuter. Um, it's funny, I went to this spay and neuter conference in Austin, Texas. And I realized finally that people in this community actually say, the, say spay and neuter as fast as I do. And all my friends make fun of me because they say it's not one word. And um, it's easy to, for that one word to become this, this thing that is foreign and something that you're doing that you don't really, you know, you stop believing in it. But um, for me, I cling to the Stories. I cling to the experiences that I have had, on, you know, on the ground that show that this is crucial. That um, if, you know, if we didn't do the spay neuter project, that mom would have kittens where three out of four of them would would die. Um, one would get hit by a car. One would um, likely kind of not make it due to mites or whatever it is. And kind of keeping that as my focus, where. 
I want these animals all to have the opportunity to have a home and um, to, to have a good outcome and a good life. And just wanted to share my contact information with you as well. So if you have any further questions after this webinar, um, you're welcome to contact me anytime. And I'm happy to help you talk through how to solve some of the problems you run into as you're working on these programs. Um, so I'll, I'll open up for questions now. Um, Kim will let me know what we have. Hi, it's Tulika speaking, and uh, I'm just going to let everybody, all the participants know that you are welcome to type in questions, uh, and we can read them out to Amy, and she'll be able to answer them, um, and everybody will be able to hear. But so far, we have nobody up for questions. So don't be shy. Everybody, uh, hopefully, you can see the spot where you can type in your questions. And I may have uh, spoken very quickly. Um, I tend to do that when I get very excited about something. So if there's anything that you would like more information on um, after maybe rewatching it, I, I'm thinking about this all the time and how to actually make a sustained difference. Um, and if you also have any tips that you would like to share with me that you you know, unique things that you've done, I'd love to hear it. Well, it seems like uh, a quiet audience today, but Amy has very generously offered um, her contact information. Oh, maybe one question has popped up. So I'll just read the first one. Is the SPCA working on spay-neuter bylaws in any town or municipality? And that's a question from Natalie Kuczynski. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And so um, we work on bylaws. Um, it tends to be where we have uh, a branch, because the branch has the ability to do um, some of the groundwork. Uh, in one example, um, I just had a meeting with a municipality that only has dog control bylaws. And um, so they're really hesitant to adopt anything else because they're limited in funding. Uh, they're limited in kind of what their staff can handle. And so what we've been doing is working on crafting messaging around um, why what, what we think that they should do, why it's going to help them. And, and that can be tricky because dogs bite and cats don't necessarily, but there's other kind of angles that you can take to, to help them understand why having humane cat bylaws can um, educate and be part of the education mission. And so that's, um, we're hinging it very much on responsible animal guardianship and to say that if someone um, has animals in their municipality, it, whether or not it's a, whether it's a cat or a dog, uh, they should be responsible with that animal in the municipality, and it shouldn't be distinguished between species. And that message is starting to really resonate with um, municipalities across the province, and it, it helps that there are municipalities, like for example, we have one Coquitlam, that is so much on board. Um, that they're, they're actually initiating some of this. And so then whenever I speak to another municipality, I can say, OK, contact Coquitlam. They're a perfect example of how successful these kinds of bylaws can be. And they're happy to talk to that municipality. So having um, kind of champions within municipalities can be crucial in affecting others.
Oh, sorry, Amy, are you yes. there? Did you yes. see a question that I read? I'll repeat it. I think it's, do we have any stats on what happens to unwanted cats? For example, the number that die, that are euthanized, spayed, et cetera. As in, uh, do, do we, as in Canada-wide, or do I keep track of those stats? Or? Uh, so the question is not, doesn't specify. Um, so you could certainly answer, Amy. And from a national perspective, the Canadian Federation of Humane Societies also collect national information from humane societies and SPCAs that participate in our annual survey on exactly those types of numbers. But uh, what about from BC SPCA? Uh, so we keep track of everything that enters our facilities. Um, and so we have numbers on each of those cats, where they, what their source is, where they come from, and then what their outcome is. And then we also keep track of how many sterilization surgeries we're doing across the province. And that includes how many colonies are being uh, trapped near to return. And uh, we don't necessarily, we haven't started keeping track of data, colony specific data. So um, where there may, some of the organizations that are doing the trapping work, they may let me know like, oh yeah, we've seen we've seen 50% of the cats um, have disappeared. We think it's likely because there's been an active coyote in the area or something like that. But we don't document all of that currently. And um, I'll just let you know, Katrin Schmidt, who asked, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Sorry if I'm not. Uh, she was the one who asked the question. And she was specifically interested in the stats being used as an education tool. And that's something that um, we haven't necessarily done yet um, because I think for the most part our stats are pretty good comparatively. So if we look uh, across the province, if we say, oh, look how bad our problem is, and we say compared to the nation we're doing much better, um, it doesn't necessarily compel people, whereas I think it works in the reverse. If you if you're State, uh, stats are worse than the national average, then you can say, look how, how bad our problem is. Um, but we're really using other strategies to try to get those stats even higher. Great. So the next question is from Stephen Sparling. How many veterinarians does the BC SPCA employ? Do the municipalities that the SPCA has uh, do do the municipalities spay neuter? Um, sorry, I'll read it again. Do the municipalities have spay neuter clinics? Also, do they have municipal animal services with shelters? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. So, uh, at at our Vancouver hospital, I believe we have four veterinarians uh, there, and then. Um, at our two clinics, we each of them only has one veterinarian because they're smaller communities. And then we have um, a, a shelter veterinarian for the whole province. And and then finally, we have a kind of chief veterinary officer to make some kind of broad scale clinic decisions. And um, that's that's been our structure so far. Um, so that one shelter veterinarian is definitely stretch pretty thin across 31 facilities. Um, but we really rely on local veterinarians and their knowledge of our animals uh, just because of the rural nature of many of our branches. In terms of the municipalities, um, in Prince George, uh, we operate the animal control contract. And, and so we... Um, we basically we do the kenneling. We don't do the the control. Um, so they have bylaw officers that bring in animals to that facility, and uh, that's how we're able to really track that intake and see it go down. In Kamloops, um, I I don't believe we have 
the handling contract. Uh, we definitely have a shelter in that community, um, but I don't. I'd have to go back and look at whether we're doing um, intake for kenneling. Oh, and, and uh, I should say also in Vancouver, um, where our, we operate a full-scale hospital, not just a clinic. And in this case, we do not do any animal control uh, in Vancouver, but the city only does dog animal control and small animals. They refuse to take in a cat. They will not touch a cat. Um, and so we tend to take in all of the stray cats at our shelter. Wow, that's too bad. Um, okay, the next question is from Deborah Silk. Is the BC SPCA willing to share printed collateral and develop curricula with other rescue organizations? Uh, absolutely. Um, we're happy to share our resources uh, as as much as they're needed. Um, and I'm definitely a good person to ask. Uh, we have a spay and neuter brochure that we uh, give out as well um, as we're developing a responsible cat brochure right now. And then we have that, that PSA and then we're actually looking to develop more materials um, in, the next, in the next year or so. Um, in line with our strategic plan. Additionally, I know CFHS has a number of materials that um, they're developing as part of the Accessible Bay Neuter Project, so they're a great resource as well. Thanks uh, for that, Amy. <laughs> the next question is, what kinds of funds does PetSmart provide? Equipment, ongoing staff costs, fee subsidy? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So there's um, there's three different things that you can apply to with PetSmart, uh, PetSmart Charities of Canada, the full name, and uh, one is a TNR type project grant, another is a low income grant, and the third is clinic um, supplies and or, or kind of equipment. So in the clinic equipment, they I, we haven't actually accessed that funding, but from what I understand, they um, they'll help you buy things like spay packs, um, the, the actual tables, the things that you need in a clinic, the materials to get something started. Um, and then, and I believe they fund up to $100,000 for that. And then uh, for the other two, basically approximately 10% of the grant um, can go to costs other than the actual surgery. So that could include... Um, staff time, that can include uh, buying traps, buying spay packs, uh, whatever it, you might need, um, advertising costs, and, and but the, really they want the bulk to go towards the actual cost of the surgeries. Great, I think that was really helpful. Um, I'll take another question here from Kim Sonneveld. And she says, you had mentioned that your local veterinarians were very much on board with your startup and the participation, or that they were participating. So how did you initially foster that enthusiasm? I'm, I'm completely um, thankful to our branch managers who are really great at fostering relationships. And so they approached veterinarians that they already get deals from at our, as our shelters and they talked through um, with them really what this could mean. And so the main, the main thing is, number one, saying, appealing to that compassionate side where, where they know, okay, there is suffering in our community and here's the information, but also appealing to their business side and saying, these are people who have never touched your clinic before. This is their first time ever entering a, a veterinary facility, perhaps. Y you now have them at your kind of dispense, you can ask their address, you can send them mail, you can talk to them about what other things animals need. And maybe right now they don't have the income to pay for a spay and neuter surgery, but that doesn't mean that down the road that they won't suddenly have some income that they can take better care of their animal. And so there's that's, that's what they have is that hook, that point of contact to say, 
I'll, I'll just keep sending them mailings. I'll just keep giving them a call to let them know, oh, it's, it's been a year. It's been two years since we saw your animal. Um, and, and perhaps that, you know, reaching out in that way is they'll get some percentage of new business that they would never get otherwise. Yeah, that's, that's great, Amy. I think we, we addressed some of those topics as well on, um, in our case for accessible stay neuter. So the importance of the veterinarian as the key contact person in developing that relationship with a client they otherwise might not have been able to. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we're going to take one more question. Sure. I'll say just one quick thing to that also. Yeah. Is I'm, I'm developing materials right now um, about how to run a successful spay and neuter blitz, how to run a successful um, microchip clinic, um, and different kind of materials for how to reach out to vets. And so those will hopefully be done by the end of this year, and then I can share them um, through CFHS with all of you as well. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Thank you. That's a great offer. OK, so I think we have time for one more question, which is from Natalie Krasinski again. Do you have any tips on dealing with people who sell kittens each year on First Nations land? Hmm. Um, I think that goes towards the messaging. Um, and it's our, our First Nations approach is very volunteer resource heavy. And so where we have key volunteers who can go um, every two weeks and they do community animal visits. So they'll actually knock on doors, they'll ask how animals are going, are there any new litters, and then they'll actually get those animals in to be spayed and neutered. And um, so what starts to happen in those communities is that the <laughs> the people in the community start to tell you what's going on. And so they'll say, oh yeah, so-and-so just, just had a litter and they're looking to sell. And, and then, so then we will actually go to their house and say, okay, we totally understand where you're at. Do you mind if we um, sterilize these animals um, and, and maybe um, even sterilize the mom? Because she's had quite a few litters now. And, and because of our rapport in that community, we end up having success. But if it's just kind of quick visits or um, in out, and you don't have the time to invest, you may not have the same kind of impact. Great. Yeah, excellent. So I don't think we have any further questions. Um, going to give it an extra couple seconds in case anybody else has a last minute thought. But otherwise, I really want to thank you today, everybody, for joining us for this webinar. And um, I know that in this forum, we can't usually show our appreciation by applause to our webinar presenter. But I sincerely want to thank Amy for sharing your perspective, for making your resources available to the community at large and for being available after the webinar to continue to share your expertise in this area. So thank you very much. Oh, we're getting some comments. Applause. Great job. <laughs> so there <laughs> you go, you. Amy. Thank you so much. Great presentation. It's another comment that just came in. So how about any final thoughts from your side? Um, I just would say keep on keeping on. Um, we're, we're all passionate about this and remember that you're not alone. Remember that there's people across the country struggling with the same things that you're struggling with and they're trying to work through them. So I think the best thing we can do is come together with our kind of intellectual resources to make the biggest change. Absolutely. Stay engaged, stay inspired. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. I uh, wish everybody um, a great afternoon. I think it's still, or rest of the morning or afternoon, wherever you are in the country. And do come back to the cfhs.ca website to look for our upcoming webinars. I think we're planning to have one in November and one in December. So please check that. And you can also look for the recorded webinars 
Um, once there, once we've had the live version, we'll shortly thereafter post the recorded version for folks to come back and uh, check back on or send other colleagues to for uh, um, you know, to get all that information as well if you know others who are interested. So have a great afternoon and thanks again for joining. Bye-bye.